it's tuesday it's 3 p.m that means it's time for another architecture social webinar Ooh. around joined by stephen drew hello and will ridgeway hello how are we doing guys are you okay Oh, it's quite hot, Jack. I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm wearing a t-shirt. This is. This is. This is the hottest day of the year. Do you think? Oh, yesterday. I this day is pretty hot. It's. It's. Have you. Have you guys bought some fans for your rooms? I've got fans, <laughs> but I, I can't have, have them on right now because we've gone a live. I can't be having <laughs> in the back. Yeah, so. okay. Right, guys. So what we are going to dive into today it's a bit of a niche topic, but I think there is a lot of um, important things that we can cover that. Um, you know, a lot of people are going to take uh, good use for. So it's all going to be centered around the idea of starting a new job at an architecture practice. So Stephen, you know, you've been there very much yourself, haven't you? Um, and that first day, because going into a practice is, is, is different like than an office, isn't it? It's different than a lot of other type of working areas. It's slightly different because it's kind of the, it's the, it's the, it's the, obviously we're designing buildings, but you've got the creative aspects and the, and the business aspects as well. So, so an architectural practice, you're typically going to be on a computer, you're going to have your own computer, you're going to have your own software. So the first thing you want to do is find out what that architectural practice is using. They should have mentioned it in an interview and probably it's really good to kind of uh, zip and, and get, get upgraded before you go, get freshened up. The last thing you want to do is join on the first day and then the person you're next to, because you want to make a good impression, you'd be like, so when you get there, obviously say hello to everyone, try to be social, try to go a bit out of your comfort zone. If you're a shy person, it's definitely worth saying hello, make an impression. You don't have to be too long, you don't have to gosh, you don't have to do anything like that. What you do need to do is the, the friends that you make here, especially if there's any other part ones as well, make an effort and make an effort and go around. But back to the software, what you don't want to do on the first day is after you said hi to Jeff and Jeff thinks, oh, he's a nice guy, then you're the person going, Do the how do I copy and paste? Oh, cheers, Jeff. And then the next ten minutes, Jeff. Sorry, this, you're like, oh no, you, you because Jeff's busy as well. So it's good to ask a few questions, but you want to fit, you want to cover the basics so that when you can ask a question, and they, they're going to say ask a few questions, but there's that element of maybe you can start focusing the questions more on learning architecture, whereas the software is something that you can probably do on your own level maybe it's sort of like with, with, with revit you will talk for instance about how the company does bim but what you don't want to do is go in there and be like okay can you just tell me everything from the start what is bim and i'm like oh no because you could have done that on your own do you want to learn the company and the stuff that you want to do when you're in practice is that you want to basically go there and be like i've done a little bit of detailing before i've done it in industry How, what would you do on this task and normally what they'll do is they'll give you a task but let's zone back in so there's so stuff to do before you go somewhere so you've got a job it's great okay first thing you want to do you probably should message the uh, HR, which is great, saying that you're excited to join. And also, if you've got a particular team leader, why don't you go a little bit out of your way in the theme of what we always talk about in this place? And why don't you call the company and you call up Jeff and you say, Look, Jeff, I really appreciate you're going to have me on the team. It means a lot to me. Uh, I can't wait to join. And I just wanted to let you know, thank you. And also, while I'm here, is there anything you would like me to do before? The interview is there anything you'd like me to read is there anything you'd like me to be familiar with or is there any software pause and you let them ask because that's helpful isn't it and so for instance one of our clients a really great company they for instance were doing elderly living and they had a book they made their own book and what they give is the start of the book before they joined and so uh, the person read the book two weeks before you get all excited, you learn about Jeff's team, you learn about what Jeff's up to, so that when you join in, you feel involved already, and you have something to talk about. So a lot of what I'm on about is familiarity. And what I'm, and, and I guess what I wanted to talk about today is, if you can, for instance, almost go in there where they know you a little bit more than fresh, that's nice. And it's nice to ask, yeah, you say hello to the HR, but the person that hired you is going to be an architectural director who saw some value. And I think if you reach out to that person and you say uh, you say something, A, it's memorable and, and thankful, and then you're asking them, ideally on the phone, and then worst case, then in an email, you're asking them what you should do to prepare. 
because I think that will focus it around. If you don't get anything, or let's say no, you're starting a contract role in a week's time, then you're gonna you might you may not have a huge amount of time to do research, but you should always use the time you've got. So if you're starting the job in a day or two, then you really want to jump in and then go through the company's website. You want to go through the software. You want to make sure that you have clothes to wear. Sounds crazy, right? But it's good to have maybe at least one suit. Remember, though, an architectural practice isn't hugely formal. What I did is that I had a suit and I would wear the suit for the first few days and I would literally sit down and put the jacket on the back of the seat and I would work in a nice shirt, not too expensive, not too cheap. You know, a nice little Marks and Spencer's jobby. You get a few of them lovely. Oh, John Lewis, let's get you some of them nice white shirts, you know, and you get about five to ten of them and you wear your suit. What you don't want to do, and I always tease Will about this when he joined the company. Remember, you wear the suit every day, and then, yeah. and then, but you know what? It is really respectful, and it's good to have it there. What I think is, it's really important to, to care, and, and you know, wear a suit, or you know, we're mad, you know, male, female, it gets some professional attire because it looks really good. But what you definitely don't need to do though is be glued in your. Um, What's the, what are they called? Jacket, suit jacket. You don't need to be glued in that all day. You definitely probably, I, I would wear a, a tie for the first few days and then you slowly want to wear it down and not wear it down to the point where you're wearing like a V-neck shirt or any of the T-shirt or anything like that. You don't want to come across and get these, you know, the wrong connotations. What you do want to do though is you want to... You'll find that typically in an architecture office, they will be wearing jumpers, smart, casual, and over time, when you when you get to know the company culture, you can relax a little bit, but it will always be with this kind of trendy twist. So it might be trendy shoes, it might be chinos, chinos are a good one, and then like a really nice colorful shirt, and then a jumper to wear over it or something like that, or a white shirt and a jumper, a polo shirt, jumper over it. Now it's going to be a bit hot for that. So you probably just want to have a nice shirt. And, you know, I wear quite flamboyant, flowery shirts. You know, you don't need to be that guy. You can wear a nice white shirt. It really doesn't matter what you wear in that way. But you just want to come across like you care. You know, on that, you on that, um, on that note, Steve, just before we get Will's thoughts as well, I um, just had a question come in, which is um, quite good to quite relevant actually uh saying hey guys what do you think is absolutely necessary to take with you on your first week okay so, you know we, we're going we're going from scratch here what, what are we taking mm, there's one or two good books actually there was like what was it the arctic's handbook you really want something with like measurements and dimensions so i think there was one book and i will put it on one of the competitions on the architecture social.com which is the arctic's pocket guide what you want is like a really good quick reference for basic stuff. So say now someone asks you to draw rises or, or, or on stairs, sometimes this book can be really helpful and kind of tell you the questions that you were going to bother Jeff with, again, in the analogy. So I think that's really good. Well, you don't want to take too much. I bought, it always nice to buy a briefcase. And what's quite funny is like whenever I get a job, my dad goes, oh, you know what? call you a nice briefcase so you can go to the job right uh, but you know what they're really handy so maybe not a briefcase but what i call man bag that's very you know when you've got your bits and bobs in there you've got your you it's good to take a few you want to take a few nice pens you're probably going to be given a notepad or something what you'll find in an architectural practice is that they'll give you a book to log stuff down because that can be a legally binding document sometimes that in, you know in a meeting you take the notes so you'll find that they'll kit you out what um, oh, yeah, I tell you what, Will brought it up before this, actually. There's probably a few legal documentations, which is really good to take on your first date. So maybe you want to run through the stuff that normally we ask for in recruitment, Will, and normally the stuff that HR might ask you on your first day to bring. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, a lot of this stuff, they might ask you before you even come in, and you can just send the photocopies over. But um, um, practices will need to have, like, passports, for example. So it's always worth bringing your passport in if they've not already received the passport. Um, you'd also want, um, which one's the uh, one from uh, when you've just finished a job? Yeah, yeah. P so P45. P45, P45, that's it. So you might have to bring that one that in as well. Um, but it's mainly, you know, that's only if they've not previously asked for it beforehand because they'll need to use it uh, at some point. And your national insurance number for getting the payroll, but that might already be sorted beforehand. But it's always worth just having those handy in case you get asked to bring them in the next day. You can be like, 
actually I've got them here now. Would you like them? Uh, would yeah. you like it sooner rather than later? Because it's better because then that way they can get everything sorted for you uh, quicker rather than having to wait for you to like find it at home. Because you, you know, it's my, my passport. I have no idea where my passport is at the moment. I have to go looking around my entire room to go find it. I have an idea where it might be. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know where it is. So it's always worth um, having that handy so that you can so that you can just bring it in or just have it with you. Um, don't, worry, don't worry, Will. You won't be going on any airplanes anytime soon in this world. No, I, I know. <laughs> That's Hopefully know you're not going to be looking for another job, so you won't need that passport. But no, yeah, <laughs> take your bank account details as well. That's the one everyone forgets Absolutely. because you want to get paid, right? So it's always the most important thing to bring that as well. And yeah, I think that that's the kind of stuff you want to take. So for me, it's more about the mindset before going. Because so as Will talked about, you've got your passport, you've got the basic details to get paid, and you, you're you taking you know national insurance. Really, the it's more about your mind frame. We talked about dressing appropriately for it. And it's more about not getting yourself in the weeks building up to it into an absolute kerfuffle and panicky. You know, you might, you might, you might, so if you go into a physical place, that's what you want to do. You want to get your clothes, you want to get all the stuff. Really good question, Sana, you brought in. So the, right now we're in a bit of a strange thing. We're actually onboarding, could even be digital, right? Which is quite strange because I've always gone into an architectural practice physically. And that's what I'm talking about now, all these physical stuff. It's still good to have that mind frame because you need to be, especially in architecture, you're gonna be you they might even ask you for instance on the first few days to go somewhere on site so you still need to have all this kit we're on about you still need to get they still handy to have the books around that we're on about the resources still handy to get all the clothes so you feel professional and even when you start work i would definitely one top tip i mean today i'm wearing a t-shirt because it's boiling the thing is that when you're working you almost want to you always want to be you almost want to wear professional work uh professional clothes sorry and even when you're working digitally, because there's something about your mindset when we you work at home. And if you're dressing a fit um, in your work attire and if you dress professional, you're conditioning your mind to respond in a certain way. So they, so a company, you definitely should ask beforehand, Sana, if you, if you are to use your own laptop, you need to talk about the IT. So right now you might have the computer, a laptop being sent by it, to you, they might ask you to use your own. It could vary based upon the company because some companies will have their own, like intranet. Is that the worst word I'm on about? Like a Citrix buys, you know what it is? Like the closed like area, a like a yeah, like a firewall access. So they might want their own laptops. They might have their own AutoCAD licenses, or it could be that you are expected to have a setup yourself. So we are all working on our own laptops at the moment but it could have been the other way where you need to provide your own this is definitely worth asking because we, we what you don't want to be caught out with is you don't want to start and they go oh do you not have your own laptop and then you then then you're in this kind of in between zone and you can't really start yet and uh, that's quite important you need to find out what time you're starting so in the old days pre covid you would normally agree a time to start. It usually would be an hour or two after the start of the day. So it'd be like, say, say now, Stephen Drew's awesome architectural practice, super amazing, amazing company, opens up at nine, then you do probably find that you start at 10 o'clock. And that's purely so they can get the IT systems. And it could even be the same in this way, where they need to clear you into the system. So you need to ask what time you're starting. You need to get all the details over ready. Because if you're going to be sending the HR, your passport digital, you still need to do that. It's definitely worth finding out what software you're going to be using and how it would work. Because so, for instance, with Revit, some architectural practices, you will almost be like TeamView. You will be using a virtual computer, which is emulated from the distance. Or you might find that you're actually using BIM alive on your computer. So you know, uh, Granny's laptop is not going to be able to handle Revit, whereas uh, Jack Moran's super gaming computer with his 144 hertz monitor is definitely going to be able to handle the BIM model. So it's really worth finding out there. I think, I think it's that... also, sorry, Steve, as well, if you do have your own laptop, uh, if they ask you, if you are working remotely and they do ask you to use your own laptop, it's important to find out what software you need to have on that laptop already. So whether they need 
um, you know, uh, your well, Revit, for example, if you need to have Revit installed and how you get that installed as well, because they'll probably give you the license for that. Um, so you have to set that up yourself. Um, you also obviously need like InDesign, you know, other, other programs as well that might be regularly used. So it's important to find out which ones you need on a laptop if you're using your own one so that you can yeah. get it installed and also make sure that your laptop can run it as well as Steve mentioned earlier. So that's that's the uh, that's important. But on the whole, I think they'll probably give you your own laptops for most for most studios, would they? Yeah, I think you'll find that a lot too. Sometimes they will if you already have your own, they might just say you can have a laptop. But if you have your own that's better spec, then maybe you can use that. Probably good to talk about licensing actually because it's popped up actually one or two times on the architecture social where people talk about how do you get AutoCAD license for free. Now, AutoCAD licenses and even Adobe, I think, are usually available to students. Back when I was studying in the olden days, we didn't even have that. So you'd have to know someone who would download one and, you know, it was a bit of a dodgy key and you had to put it in, right? And, hey, you're learning. So it's not that particularly important. Uh, Autodesk is not going to come knocking on a student's door who wants to study in architecture over that. It's very unlikely. What you've got to remember, though, now you're in a commercial world and commercial projects, right? It's all about making money. And the thing is, the when, when an architectural practice, which in essence is a business, is running for commercial profit, uh, if you're using software which is not licensed and they're aware of it, and if they're aware of it, then that's not good because an architectural practice should not be okay with that but um especially i remember once i had my laptop i brought in one day and they, when i was at epr and it had like an old photoshop license and then I, I just used it at the time and it was all cracked and the thing is was that the output the drawings i had was in that and then they, later i didn't feel comfortable and then i remember at the time the director saying to me that look never ever do that again i know your computer is a lot faster you let me know and we'll get you a faster computer. And that's what they did. They gave me a bit of a faster computer. But the thing is from that is that if they got out or for instance, if Microsoft does a scan and if there's anything illegal, because you get these companies get a lot of inspections, then you're in a lot of trouble or you put them in the employers into a lot of trouble, which therefore makes you in this precarious, stressful world. So you definitely, definitely, definitely don't want to use pirated software for an architectural practice. What you do in your own time is a bit different, and that's not such a problem. It's more about drawings being made, which are published, which have been used in illegitimate software. Or if Autodesk comes in and does a scan, and your website's got loads of cracks in there, that's probably not good. So find out. So it's a good question. So you're going to find out about the licensing. You're going to find out about the computer. You're going to get your nice clothes ready so that you're ship shape and sharp, ready to start looking good. And you're going to get one or two handy resources. You want to look at books or resources in particular uh, that are helpful more, I'd say, on the technical construction side, because that's the bit that's quite struggling. And then you also maybe want to get one or two, invest in one or two things about the software that you're going to use. So you might get a Revit, master in Revit book. And then I would personally get a, a, a pocket handbook, which says all the architectural little tidbits, size of the doors. You want to learn stuff like how big the opening should be. So that's accessible for wheelchair users. So that's what I would do. I remember when I was in architecture practice, spent ages going over floor plans, making sure that um, certain accessible flats would fit the right size. And there's, there's certain books like this, which will have this information. Stuff like what is the dimensions of a brick? Oh, I've forgotten now, so that's not very good. But the book would say. Well, and I could do um, Stephen as well. So it's yeah. as well. But what? Because you've you know you've actually been there and done it in terms of the practice for a lot of you know the graduates or people who are going on what what can they expect like on a first day in terms of you know, what oh. you, what's the actual work like on that first day? Okay, good question. So you basically are probably quite nervous on the first day. Base this on me. So you know you're like oh here we go and you, it's that you big day out and then you go and so at the time at EPR. Well, I, I started and you, we we met in the boardroom and then I was lucky that I started with one of the two or three part ones 
who are now really, you know, they were really close friends with them and we kept in contact. So you can make friends doing this. And this is the point. When you go there, you really make an effort to make friends. That's the number one thing I would like to take away from it. Because it's the same thing about what we talk about artificial social as a community. The fact is friends can then later in your careers become successful. You start helping each other out and you build rapport, and, and it's quite nice not to do it alone. And even in the short term, when you go and start, so when I joined, you, I was in the room of few part ones, and then during lunchtime, you sheepishly go like, should we have a sandwich down the road? And then you go and you go to like Greg's or what have you, and you talk about, where did you get up to? Oh, I had to sign these forms. And you, you have, you, you basically you do it with other people. I mean, if you're in a small architectural practice and you're there at the start, you're going to feel a bit scared maybe to ask a few people, but maybe ask the person that you're next to, what are you up to at lunch? That's what I would try to get to encourage someone to do on their first day is to ask someone out for lunch. That would be the good big thing. So I think that's really nice because what we're on about is sort of like building up a community, building up friendship. And uh, that's what makes the whole year way more fun. Way, 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 way fun. If you're a part one, you, you've got to be brave and ask the person next to you who's an architect. If you want to, they want to go out for lunch, they probably will say yes. And if you've got other part one starting with you, then you go out for lunch with them together. So as a part one, if you've never done it before, you're going to join, you're going to, you're going to go in the morning. They're going to say, probably have a, you're going to be in a little meeting room for a little bit. And normally HR will ask you to fill out a few forms. They will ask you to fill out health and safety or contact details. So who to ring like Auntie Doreen. If you suddenly have a little accident, if you spell a few, cups of coffee or something you burn yourself who rings and all this stuff so you they take down your contact details they take down your next of kin they will they will probably ask for your passport all this stuff then you will usually go upstairs at 10 o'clock something like that to the architecture practice you'll meet the team now if you've done this a few times you're going to not going to be so nervous you know further in your new career and it's going to be more a case of you meet everyone you shake their hands you you you, you tell them a little bit about yourself and then they're going to brief you on the project and it's not too far away in architecture. So when I, when I, in part one, when I was a part one, you join and everyone says hello, then normally one or two of the directors will brief you on the project. They will let you know what stage the project's at, where it's at, and you'll probably be given a very little task. They might even say, read the book right now of where the project's at. They might say, you should need to fill out or you need to do a little drawing or they might they might give you a little task and what you'll find out is while you've got given this task you will have like the it manager come over to you and ask if your chair is in the right size fit and all this stuff and you will do all these little tasks while you do it you start learning the project normally you will have like baby steps into it where you will be introduced to the project and you learn by little tasks and by the end of the week you're probably jumping in if you want to do more and more tasks it always looks quite good to do some extra stuff so definitely be keen being and improve things and just be respectful so whenever you've done a task that's the other thing i learned if you've done a task let them know in a nice way that you've done the task you don't need to be too pushy be like hey i've done the task but at the same time, if you've done the task, don't sit there until the end of the day and then go, oh, I did that at 11. Make yourself useful. Say, I've done that. Is there anything else I can do? Can I get you a cup of coffee? And so at the time, I remember I, they used to call me sometimes T-boy because I'd always, I like, to work, <laughs> I like to go to the kitchen, but I'd like to go for a chat sometimes. I'm yeah, but then if they do it once, then they're always going to be known as the No, team, that track, the that's, just, that's the reason you never give me tea and that's your excuse. Exactly, you yeah, me, so no, I never no. give you one. <laughs> yeah, you never give me a tea, but I used to give them a tea and then, no, nah, but they like, hey, everyone likes it now and then, but you're not going to be tea. Mr. T. Mr. T. <laughs> but I mean, it depends on Mr. T, right? Because I'm Billy the Fool. Get me a cup of tea, right? Right. Get the cup of tea. Give them a be nice. Just offer it. Or what you'll find, maybe this would be a little bit less, uh, be more friendly to to you, Jack Brown, if you ask them if they need any drawings printed and stuff like that, because you can learn from that. And so in architecture, you've got to go, do you know how many hours I spend at the printer? You're going to make a good friend with that printer. Because you've got to go down there, you've got to learn how to fold things, you've got to learn how to use scale ruler. Definitely, you should be given stuff like scale rulers and pens, but it's definitely worth having. It's really, it's, it's really important to understand scale. 
I remember when I was a part one, and I was quite chuffed because I always made sure that the drawings were to scale. I'd always tell the architect for the meeting, I was like, this one's 120, this one's 100. I remember once a part three went in and printed a bunch of drawings they wanted to scale. And then all the architect's face, because he was in the meeting with a client, he wasn't happy. Because the whole point of an architectural drawing is that you need to scale it to a ruler so that they can take a correct dimension off it. And if you don't have that, then they can't work out in the meeting. So if someone's saying, how big is that door? Is it one meter? Is it two meter gap on there? So surely it needs to be three meters. And then they pull out a ruler. And if you don't have that at the time, you're going to be into trouble. I reckon that's um, quite a big worry, you know, for a lot of um, people going on the first day that they're probably worried they're going to get like, you know, like a really difficult task. Like tell us this bit more no. and show us everything no. that's wrong with it straight away. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you, you, you'll you'll be gradually eased into everything. They're not they're not going to expect you to suddenly run with a project as a as a part one. You're like just be brief on the project now, run with it. You know they you know they'll ease you in gently, and I think that's also important as well to manage your expectations. So you're not necessarily going to be going full throttle straight away. You've got to get through all these projects. For example, you you um you know they'll you probably have an idea already from the interview because they'd have told you what kind of role they would like you to be in. And then, um, you know, once you join on the day, then they'll give you a better idea of what to expect. And if you're a part one, you've got to think of it as more as it's a big learning curve um, for you. So there's lots of steps for you to, you know, learn from. It's going to be less less about, we, obviously, you'll still be producing drawings and everything, but it's going to be more learning for you as opposed to doing, if that makes sense. I'm not really sure if I'm making sense there. No, you are. You are. You just, it, look, they, 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 they've hired you because they see an ability in what you've done. When you're a part one, you're not expected to come in and give the, the formula to all the answers and, and what have you. What they want is for you to assist on the project. And so a good part one is someone that contributes ideas when appropriate. So we do want to hear that. Good part one is someone that contributes ideas. What another good part one is, is someone that can take a task on and learn. And sometimes I think someone that will ask a few questions such as, what should I do here? How should I do it? Where should I do it? And then goes off and does it. That's the ideal, that's the ideal thing. You're not expected. No one's going to say to you, okay, do the detail for the roof area. Go. And because it doesn't work like that, we'll get brief and they'll say, look, we need to do a certain detail for the roof because this one's important because what it does is it says the juncture of when it goes from this bit to that bit and so i want you to have a little look at a few of the ones we've done before have a little look at how technical drawings are detailed here's a book for it and then when you have a go at it that's the kind of thing you're expecting or it could be the other way where they say can you do a free model this is stuff that they give to me in my part one and i loved it it's my favorite bit so I do concept models and really cool stuff. And then I'd be doing all the Photoshop. I've got some of them at the moment. So they're on my website. The thing is though, we're gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'll put all the, some of them projects on because what I'm gonna roll out soon is a nice little function on the Arctic Social where we can showcase projects. And this is it, right? So when I was there in the industry, we did these really nice atmospheric stuff. And so it depends. So with me, I, they would be very, particular about technical detailing because that really wasn't my strength and they tell me what to do but then with other stuff like uh, 3d modeling i was really good i was probably like the, the top three in the whole company it was like two there's a proper visualizer who was amazing then you had one guy who was really good but then what you'll find is a lot of architects when they get all further in their careers they will not be doing stuff like visualization as much anymore so you the part one of the one that helps them so i was doing a lot of that stuff and i loved it they absolutely loved the fact that I knew software they didn't, and they could bring me to the table. So then you had a really nice trade-off between them teaching me technical stuff, and then I would just whack out these uh, ideas. And I remember one, there was so there was a client called Eve Oasis, and they were like Tesla before Tesla won. So now I don't know where Eve Oasis is. But what it was, it was a shop at the time, and I was modeling there, and they were like, what should we call it and so it was electric cars and the idea was you pop into a shop you buy your tidbits jack you know you go you go go shopping and then i was like well we model it and he's like what would you call it and i was like why don't you call it stop and shop this is cars stop the car have a shop charge it up go and he looked at me and he was like 
You're a genius. I remember feeling so good about it. And I was like, yeah, I invented stop and shop. And all the videos had stop and shop. And right, okay, I'm not saying I designed the building. <laughs> what it was nice was to contribute to part of it. And that's the thing. So while we were talking about physical stuff, the best thing that you can take to the interview is your mindset. So if you buy clothes now, right, even if you're working remotely right now, which are professional, you are, it's like that quote from, uh, for, uh, was it 30 Rock? And you know the character that, what's the guy, what's the main guy's name? And he says something like, you should dress the way, the, in the role you want to be, not in the role you're at now. Dress, dress for the job you want, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it's the same thing. Of If you are pride, okay, it carries a lot of weight. And so you want to get psychologically pumped up because you do deserve the job. But if you're wearing that nice little suit, you feel all good, you're going to go and give it your best. And the other thing is then you want to make sure that you feel confident enough about the software that you're like, gosh, when I go there, I can drive the software without crashing the BIM model, okay? You don't need to be the Mr. BIM manic guru. Yeah, and it's handy if you do have a bit of that skill sets because you might find that, hey, they really need you a lot. You might be doing the BIM stuff and you might find that you're really good at it. You want to get ready on the software. And then when we run about with the books, is that the reason I'm saying you to get these books and technical stuff is that when you're there, you feel like you know how to get the information. And that is and that what an Arctic's about. And that's what all my friends who say that been my party free say that's what an Arctic's about, is that you're not expected to know everything, but what you are expected, and it's a bit like in my job as a manager or anything, when problems come, you know where to find the information or you know how to deal with it. So you'll go, Mr. Client, I don't know what to do right now. Uh, I don't know the answer right now. I'm going to research. I know where to get it. I'm going to get back to you. And so in context of this, as a part one, when you get given a task, you feel like that if you don't know how to do it straight away, you can find a bit of the information and you can ask the right questions. Don't spend four hours going off on a tangent. That's not what you want to do. But at the same time, you 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 want you want it that. So when I've managed people, if someone asks you a question every minute, I can't think about what I'm doing, and that can almost cause the whole team to crash. Because when you're leading a team, you're kind of spurring things on, and you've got a project, and still things can fall apart. At the same time, though, if someone doesn't ask a question and I go off and then I come back three hours later and the task is not being done, then that can be a little bit frustrating because you think, oh, no, we've wasted so much time and Will Ridgeway has done a, a million things the wrong way. You know, I, I'm you enjoy your experience there. <laughs> no, you are pretty good. I just thought I would just do that to make you laugh. Um, before I joined, you know, McDonald and Company as well, I remember being on LinkedIn reading like articles about just how to, how, you know, how to do work jobs. And they all said like the most common mistake that people make in jobs is what you just said, Stephen, trying to do a task, knowing that they can't, like, they don't understand something about it, but because of the fear of, um, you know, like not wanting to annoy someone or not wanting to come across as um, incompetent, they'll try and do it anyway. And then they'll always end up to just produce like a worse result. So. Like you said, yeah, don't be afraid to ask a question. Don't ask a question every 10 minutes. I mean, if I ask a question, uh, Stephen two questions within half an hour, I've already pushed it too far. So. No, you're right. <laughs> yeah. It depends so on what, what kind of day I'm having. If I'm under pressure, right? I'll be like, Jack, what is it? It's always you're better like... to ask a question, though, isn't it? And take your time and do it right. Just don't be afraid to yeah. ask. It's your first day. You're not going to be expected to do a million things. No, it's about no. striking the balance between using initiative and also asking questions. I think you know you don't want to use initiative too much in case your initiative is wrong for whatever reason. But so asking the questions helps point you in that direction, and then you you know you ask help that way. And it's always worth as well if the person you're asking help with is just always busy. You know, ask your ask the person next to you, the other person next to you, maybe someone on your team, see if they can help, for example. And then that also helps you start conversing with them. Look, and the other thing, while well, I like to talk what Will said, if you're initiative, it's, it's like taste, and there's a really good analogy with this, right? Look, one day when you've got all this experience, the reality is you're most likely going to be a very successful and accomplished architect. There's a big difference between never feel stupid about not knowing it. And to, uh, what you want to do is you're not, if, if you've been taught and you keep making the mistake, well, then that's a different scenario. When you haven't done something yet, okay, you have going to make mistakes and things are going to happen. But what you're going to do is that over time, 
when you get more experience and more confidence, you make less mistakes, you do start more stuff yourself autonomously. So don't have a panic attack on day three if you go, I don't know what I'm doing and I, I can't do it. It will come with time. And so it, when it, it goes back to what Will and Jack were saying about questions, there's another art form is that it's if you can ask a question efficiently and clearly, that's good as well. What you don't want, is, and, this, and, and we even find it in this, I'm always amazed when someone asks me a question and they insert a story and statement in there. So, for example, so say now I go, Jack, where is the families for this bin model in the bathroom? I can't find it. Could you help me, please? That's quite clear. And you go, Steve, I'm busy. Give me five minutes. Cool. If I go, Jack, you're right. The thing is, I just load up the model and I've gone through it now. And what's really good is that I've done three of the first sections and, and they were they were really, really good. And I did the doors and that was interesting. Uh, I, I messed things up at the start and I changed it. And so now I'm on the bathrooms and it's really interesting the kind of bathrooms we're using. And then you're like, oh my God. And then you go, Oh, by the way, yeah. So, what family should I use? Because I use. Do you see how long this is taking? How frustrating. So, there's like this really nice thing. You got to think of it like it's like a Swiss Army knife. It's like a team. It's like it's again. It's like this conveyor belt of efficiency. And so, a really good team over time, you develop the thing where, for instance, when we're working together now, we kind of know when to ask questions, when to not, when's important, when to make a call yourself. And also to do things, but that takes time. That's taken us a year to build that up. And where it comes from is getting in sync with people. Because also, when you're in an office, the, the 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 interesting thing is we're human beings, right? You can have someone who's absolutely amazing at technical drawings, and maybe they're quite difficult to speak to. Maybe they even sound quite rude. You might have someone that's quite charismatic and quickly impatient. Don't know who that is. And then you might get other people that are really, but you know, they were really clever. They just don't have much time. And there's the, you're going to get the whole range of stuff. Okay. And you've got to work out these personalities and you've got to gel yourself with the person. Now, what you've got to remember is everyone, the ultimate goal, you're always going to get one or two people in life that are going to be a bit difficult. And that's part of life. You've got to learn to work around them. That's just unfortunately the way it is. What you've got to remember, though, most people are very good and good-natured. They're going for the goal. And some people can almost seem quite impersonal, but what they're doing is they're making that building, they're making the project the best they can. And I, I guarantee you, if you come in there with an attitude of trying to really help out on a project and assist and get stuff done, that will go noticed. And those are the people that, as a part one, you'll get invited back for part two. And those are the people in the company. Because what it's about is it's about your you wanting to help. You wanted to get that project over the line. And therefore, that's when that kind of attitude is what's going to save you if you do one or two mistakes. Well, the attitude that isn't going to go well is like when I was on about someone meandering or someone that is kind of not really paying attention. Because that is so what I like is people on my team is I like people who are hungry for the opportunity, want to do better, and are willing to listen. That that formula I can work with a lot. Where it gets difficult is defensive people. Because when you're trying to help someone out, you're gonna explain a task to them. And so I'm thinking of myself as an employer and you, I always believe in the person's ability if I've really hired them, okay? But sometimes what we got to do is you're almost going to get past your ego on things. And so it, some things you almost, maybe you feel a little bit insecure. You might feel in your head that the person is talking to you and, and you don't really know the staff and it almost seems condescending. No one should talk to you in a bad manner. But what I'm on about is if I tell you, that's wrong. We need to do that. And this time you want to check this quicker. Check that. Check that. Remember, it's not personal. It's about doing it the right way. Now, if an employer is talking to you in a derogatory sense, saying like, why did you do this? Are you stupid? Then that's wrong. And I personally think then that is an attitude of someone unprofessional. And I would question whether I want to work that company long term. But with my thing is that if you get something wrong, it could be like, come on. You can do this better. I've seen you do it better. And then so you, that's the kind of thing. It's like coaching. It's like that whole thing. But to do that, 
to be coached the right way, you need to bring it as well. And so that's what I mean. Like it's like the coach thing in 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 the sports. It's like as long as you keep going and there's that energy, then then the employer can work with that. And so if you go to a job, start on this job with this appetite, then that would be great. If you literally go in there to clock stop and not learn, it might be enough. To me, if you if you're an employer and someone was above and beyond. But when I say above and beyond, I don't mean work until one o'clock every night. What I'm on about above and beyond is doing the tasks efficiently and sensibly over time and adapting. And when you've made a mistake, you learn from it. You take it on board. You acknowledge it's your mistake, but you don't condemn yourself for the mistake. You go, oh, do you know what? I messed up. I should have been more far. Next time I will do that. You don't go, I can't do it. And, that, and the employer shouldn't as well. Where it goes wrong, though, is if an employer has told you something and you consistently do the mistake. And it's a bit like you're not at home. It's like, hello, please, can you just listen? And that's the thing where that can be concerning because what happens down the line is that if you're, you're not paying attention and then if you're not paying attention, you let stuff slip. And when stuff slip, then it, it can put you in a predicament. So the, there is an easy way not to do this, though. And the, the way is to do, always pay attention, always listen. Don't go into an office and wear your headphones because, yeah, if you do a, a task and it's boring, you're going to be tempted to put on the headset. The thing is, though, you're not learning. You're not learning subliminally of other stuff. And it's the same thing. And uh, My actual practice there at EPR, they encourage people not to go on headphones unless you were literally in the rendering corner for ages because – you, you learn stuff about the project, you learn stuff about what's going on. And it's the same thing on my team is that I'm not a big fan of headphones because you soak so much information from the people around you that it's helpful. And also you're more likely to build friendships and you have banter. And you can't really have banter if you're listening to Radio 1. You need to be in the room, you need to be present. Um, sometimes uh, you can be a bit too... You can get distracted by banter. I'm the worst person at that. I think I've distracted you guys a few times. It's probably not the best role. Me, mate. <laughs> well, it's character building. Because when you go above and beyond my distractions, then I know I can. <laughs> it's because yeah. we put on headphones. <laughs> no, you never know. <laughs> no. do, you know, do you know what I mean, though? What I'm trying to get at is there's that then we start to know each other. We have jokes. We get along. And I think if we're all on, on the headsets, then we can't even do that. And it's like think, even yeah. now. When we when we were so I, the reason is why we can openly talk about this stuff is because we all know each other. There's no awkwardness because of intense amount of times under pressure when you've got to go into the zone and then you have times for laughs and banter. Yeah, I think headphones can be a bit of a barrier because like if you're wearing your headphones, then you, people are less likely to come up to you to say hello, you know, on your first day, for example, because you look like you're to yourself, for example. Whereas if you haven't got them on you're suddenly more open to be approached and also you can listen to everyone uh for example so you might hear some chatting or someone talking about the latest show last night that you watched you'd be like oh yeah i watched that and you can bond that way and that yeah. make friendships that way so it's important to you know be aware of your surroundings listen and um and that's how you get along with people and the more people you get along with the the more enjoyable it is to work there as well i think do you know what's interesting? When I was hearing us talk about this now, I'm like, how it's it's gonna in this digital world, I tell you what, because again, I flip back to the physical best, you know, yeah. imagine a school in an office. And the thing is though, you need this stuff is still applicable for an office. And actually, what you find a lot of architectural practices right now are talking about going back to the office, and there is gonna be a split of being in the office. And then there's going to be a split of working digitally. So the same thing needs to be that you need to ask the right questions and make yourself available. And you need to basically, when, for instance, you're working digitally online, you need to still contact people with your team leaders at the right moment. I mean, we do it organically here. And that's probably the best way to talk about it. Of The good thing about working remotely is that sometimes you get a bit more time to concentrate. The downside is that things can slip. And if you don't have a morning meeting or you don't have these kind of community aspects, then you can start to feel isolated. The worst thing you do is you don't want to start being a part one 
but gets stranded at home and doesn't do much. You really need to fight to make sure that you've got enough work to work on so that you're secure, your job secure, and you're learning without being too fussy. You don't want to be ringing the person all the time. Maybe there'll be a function where you can drop messages on the system, and maybe there's a message thing where you can say, can we have a catch up on a period of time? So what I would do is I would work on a task and I would say, well, I have finished sections one or two. They are ready for review. Can we talk at 11.30 about this, review it, and next steps? Yeah? And they go, can't do that. I can do 11.45. Good stop. So you've been involved. You're keeping them up to date. That is an efficient worker. What you don't want to do is just go home and then start thinking, oh, do I say something? Do I not? And then you're twiddling your thumbs. You're hanging around by the washing machine. And... Yeah, again, when you're working at home, try not to let other stuff bleed into it because I struggle with it at first as well because when you're at home, you're like, this is brilliant. I'm going to do the cleaning while I'm on the phone and you're getting all distracted. Nah, uh, uh. You've got to be, you got to imagine right now that you are physically in the office in your digital world because that's going to be the best way you're going to become a best employee right now. So you're going to need to uh, make sure the room's quiet, make sure you're available, make sure the internet works. Gosh, that's a good one to do before you're in. Because uh, right now you need to make sure that you're on. You, what you don't want to do is start the day and then you go, my internet can't handle certain things. That's going to be an absolute nightmare right now. Because you need to be onboarded digitally as physically. And then as well as that, you do need to have this attitude of being made to be available physically at the drop of a hat. So get a, get a travel card ready that you can top up on the go or use your, your debit card if you're in london and you know if someone says do you want to go on the site you will basically say yes because i'll tell you what if i hired someone and they go i can't really do that day it's not convenient for me can we do it next week i'll be like what you're <laughs> starting with me you need to make yourself accessible and and, and uh, so and when i say that i'm not on about going knee deep into the coronavirus territory of death what i'm on about is if something sounds sensible like the office has a coronavirus plan which they should all legally have and you have allocated times and days to go there or more likely you're going to go visit an architectural practice you're going to see something on site then you need to make sure that you can go there you need to make sure you have a mask that's going to be a good one right now you're going to have your little mask of i go in here there we go. You're going to get out your little mask. You're going to put it on like Hansel and Gretel. You're going to look like the mask murderer and get yourself ready. The worst thing, can you imagine if you start somewhere and you go, I can't go because I haven't got a mask? That would be a faux pas. So get your mask ready. Get all your stuff. Get your kit ready. So maybe what we should do now is let's summarize things, but let's summarize it in before starting the job, digital and physical. On the day, starting physical and digital, and then things to do during physical and digital. So going there digitally is before you go. Have you got your computer set up? Have you asked how the software should be? Have you asked, have you made sure that you've got headsets at work, you've got a camera so everyone can see your beautiful face? And have you made sure that you've got everything? Does the software work? Do you need to bring your own laptop? Have you asked that you're going to be there digitally? Have they asked what, and asked what time it's going to start? Physically, if you're going to go to the office, get your mask, go to the shop, get your suit, get your thing. You're going to get your suit anyways because you need to digitally look like a pro. You're not going to be there in a shirt with stains in a, in a really unflattering pose. You know, you're gonna you're gonna look professional. You're gonna be all you're gonna be all crisp and clean. You're gonna get your clothes physically. You're gonna go buy books on Amazon, digital books, physical books. You're gonna look at books which were designed for students to start. The one that immediately comes to mind is the Architects Pocket Handbook, stuff like that. You want to get websites. You want to go onto communities like the Architecture Social and ask, hey, do what pe what do people use right now, which is really handy. So there's a particular uh, lady that I'm going to be doing a podcast with in, in Australia who runs uh, My First Architecture Job, which is all about this. So it's going to be interesting to see what that course is about. Stuff like that, right? You really want to be looking at her course. I think it's her name, Sarah Lebner. Check it out online. 
and uh, it seems really great it's all about the detail and stuff that because i'm i understand the recruitment process and i've done architecture well, she is going to be an expert on technical drawing and all this stuff so you want to look at courses like that you want to learn you want to speak to people you've listened to our opinion ask people who were part ones from before how they started as well okay preparation before and you're going to ask the company before you go there what you need to prepare you're going to ring them up and you're going to say do i need the software is there anything you'd like me to learn any reading any information like that on your start day you're going to find out if you start there digitally or physically you're going to find out what time you start you're going to get all your paperwork your passport your bank details so you can do it as efficiently as possible and you are going to meet your team and you're going to try and bond with them if you can't physically go out for lunch with everyone, oh, that is a frustrating kind of debunk my whole what I was talking about earlier. But actually, <laughs> then maybe what you want to do is um, you need to find a way that you can socialize with these people. And you know, maybe you'll find that you'll have team drinks at the end of the thing. Definitely, definitely do any social events on the architectural practice. And you don't want to go in there and get absolutely hammered if it's a drinking event and be known as that guy. Because no one likes to be that guy. And it's not good if I'm the hiring manager and I've hired someone and the person on my team is the guy that did loads of inappropriate stuff. Everyone can get a bit drunk sometimes, but what you want to do is make a good first impression. But you do want to get involved and have a beer, have a glass of champagne. You want to get to know people. And maybe what you could do is if it's digitally, the team leader that you join is that you say, could say something like, look, I'm going to crack on the phone of the day. Maybe what we could do is I could bring you at lunch for 10, 15 minutes to hear your advice or feedback and stuff. Or maybe we can have a bite over lunch together. That would be quite, I'd quite like that if I started with another part one. Find out the other part ones you start at the same time. And then what, try to have a friendship circuit. Might like the breakfast club where you're all sitting down and getting along with each other. Okay. So what other things have we got to mention start date? Well, what? Thought, yeah, so we've done the start date. We've gone through the first well, we're arriving on the first day, haven't we? And what it's going to be, yeah. like, um, any workload, what's to be expected of you? I thought we, we had a question come in, which I thought would be a nice little roundup. And it's definitely one for you, Stephen. Um, a bit of a nostalgic question. Is there anything you regret not doing during your part one? Oh, <laughs> million dollar question, isn't it? I had a really good part one. Um, probably would have pushed the technical aspects more. So I was never that good at it. And what I did is that I got a lot better at architectural visualization, which was great. The thing is, though, that was what I was really good at. So it's like I put my best skill up and I was very basic and technical detailing. OK, and therefore I could have improved that more doing that. So when I went to part two, I would have built up on it a bit more and then, and then when I when I studied my part two, it would have been stronger. And then when I come back, I'd be even stronger. And so what I did is I ignored what I felt was a weakness in order to build up a strength. And that worked a little bit in my part two because I came the expert on doing part one drawings, bashing stuff out, doing 3D models. And I had it down that basically in MicroStation, because everyone was rendering in SketchUp and all this stuff. And Revit, we were moving to Revit, and basically I was taking MicroStation models and I made it render in the software without any plugins on any computer. And so I optimized the process that any basic computer could knock out an image really quickly. So this was no like Magnum Opus, but what it was is that you could bash something out. And so the point is, I was really proud of that. The thing was though, is that when someone then needed me for a technical drawing, that didn't matter. And so while I optimized the process, I wasn't an all-rounder. And that's something I learned deeply. And that's something that at the time I regret. But now that's why even in recruitment, uh, I think that what, what I always talk about with you guys is that uh, while I'm good in certain things, what I make sure is that I'm good throughout, the, I'm comfortable throughout the process. Whereas some people are exceptional at one bit. What I like is that in recruitment, I, in, in my job now, I can take a brief or a role for an inception or get a role and carry it across the line. And that makes me feel a lot stronger. Whereas in architecture, what I'm trying to say, Jack, is because I didn't push the bits that I wasn't comfortable with, I became an expert in one area. And the danger yeah. is with that, it's good to specialize into a 
a certain sector or two. It's so, like a pigeonhole, you know, isn't it? Yeah, well, what you want to do is make sure that you're versatile throughout the process because what happens is in the industry is that if you just worked on overseas buildings at front end stages, it's really hard to get your job on a London scheme on technical stages. So that's my thing is that push the areas in part one you're not comfortable with yeah, to become better. And all the stuff we're talking about is to get you in the right mindset to learn and for you to feel confident. Remember, they've hired you because they see an ability and strength and you're not expected to know everything. You're expected to bring maybe one or two little ideas, like technical tidbits, you know, software and stuff. But what they're expecting you to do is someone that you're someone they believe in, that that they can give instructions and that you're going to learn. You're going to ask appropriate questions. You're not going to ask too much. You're not going to ask too little. And you're going to help out. Above all, they're looking for someone. They've hired you because they want you to be part of the team to get stuck in the project and get get going. And that's the thing. Push yourself on the bits you're not com comfortable with. Go the extra mile. It will get noticed and you will feel better for it. That doesn't mean working in eight hours and being pushed over. I'm on about a respectful team, you getting involved and be, wanting to be the best you can to help the project out. Brilliant. Anything from your side, Will? No, that was pretty well done, really. I think oh, it's just all about having the right attitude, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, if you've got, yeah, you've got the right working attitude, you'll do it right because it'll be seen. And, um, you know, not only will you do well, but you'll get recognised and it'll just, like, improve your overall experience. And I think it's yeah. just all about, you know, you're not you're not expected to know everything. You're there to learn. And they, you know, they they believe that you will add to the team. So you're there for a good reason, really. So it's just all about doing well, you know, do some work behind the scenes if you want um, to help you improve your learning and then also ask help you ask relevant questions, you know. And actually help contribute ideas to the team if you're helpful it'll be really appreciative yeah big time but well said and remember you don't need to do it alone even if you go into different practices make friends with part ones part two as architects who are starting in companies learn from each other how did this company set up how did that company set up and it goes back to the community so the best thing about architecture social community is we all learn from each other people who started the year before people who started then and when part one's finished in an architectural practice they're just about to finish and you're about to start. So I remember when that happened, I would always try to go for lunch with the part one and make them feel comfortable, make them feel at home. We have this opportunity here on the architecture social as well as your architectural practice. The people that get involved more, share ideas, share experiences. They are the leaders of tomorrow. So be active in your community and learn from each other. And don't worry about it. You, you can do this and you will have fun time. Well done on your job. Excellent. I think that wraps up everything for this week. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoy the rest of the week. And we will see you same time next week for our next episode. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take see care. You, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. I'm going to turn my fans on now. Woo! See you later.